All right, guys, I think we're live, and the new camera and new mic should be working, finally. Um, I did some testing yesterday and was able to... My camera has this function where it, like, shuts off automatically after 10 minutes, and there's no way to, to override that. Um, but I finally figured out how I watched a bunch of videos on YouTube. Um, and last week I was having to use my laptop camera. Um, some people said they couldn't really hear me very well. Should be better this time. Um, I picked up a little, um, not fancy, but a nice, you know, a decent condenser mic. Um, so the audio should be better. Uh, let me know in the, in the chat if you can hear me. Um, if you can see me okay. If the video's choppy, you know, any, any issues. There still may be a few things to iron out, but it should be uh, much improved over last week. Hey, Vic from Olympia. Hey, Paulina. Good seeing you guys. Glad you able to show up. Um, yeah, there's a decent number of people showing up. Oh, thanks, Frankie. Um, so, okay, uh, last week... In the uh, stream about, can hear you well. Okay, great. Um, oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm still on my. I have an old laptop, and so it's not really built for live streaming. But I think it should be probably good enough. Um, the video may get a little choppy at sometimes. Hopefully not. But um, I'll go with both video and audio. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, last week in the one about how to read cursive, uh, I talked about, um, you know, that I had sat down and come up with, like, six months worth of uh, possible topics that we could talk about um, if we were going to do this every week. Um, and I wanted to, just while we're waiting, you know, people are still showing up, so uh, while we're waiting for that to happen... Um, I just wanted to read off a few of the ideas so you can kind of get an idea of what we're thinking about. And then so hopefully that can get you guys thinking about like what type of topics you'd like to see us cover. And I, I've tried to include a good mix of things like stuff that is going to be interesting to just a general Chinese learning audience. Um, stuff that is more niche, like the last two videos that I did, one on classical Chinese and one on how to read handwriting and cursive. Those are kind of niche. I, I mean, I think they should be applicable to everyone, but a lot of people aren't really into those things. Um, so it's maybe a little more niche. This one is more of a general topic, uh, intermediate and advanced textbooks. Um, I wanted to do that specifically because there's tons of stuff out there for beginners. All the apps that you find are for mostly for beginners, you know, um, a lot of the really well-known textbook series are for beginners. That's where most of the market is. Um, and so, like, I spent, when I was learning Chinese, I spent a ton of time researching different textbooks and which ones to use at what times and stuff. So, um, and it worked very well for me. So I figured, you know, I, I have something useful to say here. Um, but then, so, so general interest stuff, niche stuff, and then also some stuff related to, like, outliers research in paleography, historical linguistics, stuff like that. So... Uh, I tried to include a good mix of topics. So here's here's some of them. Um, so Chinese textbooks for advanced students. That's what we're doing today. How to learn to read newspapers in Chinese. All about simplified characters and simplification. Um, how I learned Chinese. And then one where Ash can talk about how he learned Chinese. Um, and we're going to get Ash on a few of these too. Um, yeah, it is hard to find. Uh, especially it's hard to find good info about it. Like, uh, I feel like I always felt like people would get to a high level and then, uh, sort of stop participating online or whatever, uh, which I've sort of done the same thing. I don't post on Chinese forums nearly as much as I used to. And I used to have a blog where I'd talk about my learning journey. I haven't posted on the blog in years, but, um, yeah, hopefully this will be helpful to people. Um, so yeah, so like I said, we're going to get Ash on a few of these, um, he just finished writing a paper that he's going to be publishing, um, and so he's sort of decompressing from that. He made like a mad dash, month-long scramble to get it written. It's a really interesting paper. I've read part of it, um, 
maybe I can get him to come on and talk about that paper at some point. That'll be one of those like niche or like related to outlier stuff. But um, learning how to express emotions in Chinese, that's an interesting one. Um, if you've ever like gotten angry uh, during an interaction in Chinese or, or someone was rude to you and you just all your Chinese ability just flies out the window when that happens. Uh, it's actually useful to practice being angry <laughs> if, you know, if you want to be able to do that. So, because otherwise you, your adrenaline is going and you just lose all your ability. Um, so not just anger, but that's, that's an easy one that like, I used to get frustrated because like if somebody did something that, that made me angry and I couldn't, I just couldn't say anything because my Chinese was gone. Uh, you actually do have to practice, uh, intro to paleography. So that's, you know, one of our research topics. Uh, how do we know what middle and old Chinese sounded like? Somebody asked that in the video on, uh, on learning classical Chinese. Um, good Chinese movies for learners. So both movies that are, you know, in Chinese originally and movies that have been dubbed into Chinese really well. And I'll, I'll give a spoiler on that. DreamWorks does a fantastic job with voiceovers. So if you like Shrek, I, I used to watch Shrek in Chinese all the time to practice my Chinese. It's fantastic. They do a great job. Um, Chung and Sui is reading into a new China. I actually don't know that one. Uh, off the top of my head, I think it's maybe part of a series uh, that sounds like one of the Princeton textbooks, which I think some of those are also published through Chung and Sui. Um, I've looked at some of those. I didn't use them myself, but they're really good. Um, they're really good. They, um, they, if I remember right, they have texts in both, like within the same book in both simplified and traditional. So you can use it whichever one you're, you're focusing on. Uh, they use a few of the books in that series, uh, at ICLP. So if, if that's part of that series that I'm thinking about, it's, I'm sure it's very good. Um, what else? S software for Chinese learners. Um, how to learn Cantonese. How to learn Cantonese once you already speak Mandarin. So Ash speaks Cantonese quite well, actually. So he'd be, we'd bring him on for that. Uh, resources for learning Taiwanese. Uh, intro to uh, historical, like textual criticism. You know, so that's more like our research. Um, text studies, xiao xue, stuff like that. How to learn to read bronze script. Um, that'll be fun. How to learn, uh, Xiao Zhuan, which is the small seal script. That's actually quite easy to learn, uh, once you're already comfortable with modern Chinese characters. Um, you'd be surprised how easy it is to learn Xiao Zhuan. Uh, how to start learning Chinese as a beginner. Self-learning versus classroom learning. Uh, textbooks versus using native materials. Uh, manga in Chinese, or manhua as they call it in Chinese, as a learning tool. I used to read a bunch of manga. I, I was never really into it before uh, I was in Taiwan, but it was a good way of getting like good practice in with stuff that was at a, a an appropriate level for me. Um, should you read Chinese tr translations of your favorite books? Um, how to learn Chinese from Chinese TV shows and movies. How to learn about Chinese history. Uh, what it's like going to grad school in Taiwan. Uh, what it's like going to the Mandarin Training Center in Taiwan. Um, so there's that's that's not all of them that I've written down, but that's a good sample of them. Uh, hopefully that gives you guys some ideas of like the type of stuff that you'd like to see. Um, what Chinese m manga can I recommend? I mostly read stuff that had been translated from Japanese. Uh, so I read Death Note. I really enjoyed Death Note. I read a few volumes of One Piece. Um, I forget what else. There was one called Alice, which was like a weird Alice in Wonderland sort of spinoff type thing. And I think that was originally written in Chinese. Um, I've got a big stack of them in the library. So I, when I do that, I'll bring it, you know, I'll bring all the ones that I have. And... Um, I mostly rented them though. There's a store in in Taipei close to Shida, uh, the university I was at, that rents out manga. So you can just go and pick up a stack of them for like a dollar or something like that, and keep them for two weeks, if I remember right. Uh, so 
most of the ones that I read I don't actually own. They were rented, but I do have a stack at home. Uh, graded readers. Um, yeah, they're fantastic. I didn't really make much use of graded readers. Um, but... I, I think they're really useful. I What I did, and I'll, I'm going to talk about this in the video today. Um, the, well, there are some readers that I used. Um, I would say like Mandarin Companion, uh, they make great stuff. And I believe those are available in Pleco now. Um, so there, there's there been a kind of explosion in graded readers for Chinese in the last few years, which wasn't around when I was learning. Um, I used, and uh, like I said, I'll talk about this in a minute, but there's a series of yellow books in Taiwan, um, and they're basically graded readers, and they're really good. I used them as like supplemental um, textbooks on the side of whatever else I was doing. Um, but yeah, they're great. Um, so I guess we've probably given people enough time to show up. I forget how to see how many people are actually here for it, but there's something on my end that I think shows me that, but I can't see it right now, but... Um, yeah, let's get into it. So, uh, let me check my notes. I want to make sure I don't ramble too much. Um, cause I have a tendency to do that. I guess I'm sure you guys have noticed. Um, okay. So the stuff I'm going to talk about today is going to be general textbooks, not uh, specialized stuff, not anything that's like, I'm not going to be, I, I was, I live in Tokyo, right? And I was at a, there was this like local church uh, the other day that was give, having a, like a book giveaway. And they had a bunch of um, like free Japanese textbooks sitting on the table. But a lot of them were things like how to read a financial newspaper in Japanese and stuff like that. Like it was pretty specialized. I'm not gonna be talking about that kind of stuff today. I do have some books about how to learn to read newspapers, but that's general. Like financial news is a kind of specialized thing. Uh, it's not something that I really ever did in Chinese anyway, so I'm not the person to talk about it in the first place. Um, things like legal Chinese, you know, specialized topics, I'm not going to touch on that. I'm going to touch on, basically, I'm going to break it down into like core textbooks and supplementary textbooks and what to look for in each. Um, like how to choose what your core books are going to be, um, how to work with textbooks, um... Yeah, but we're going to stick with stuff, you know, that pretty much anybody who wants to learn Chinese at an intermediate or advanced level can make use of. Um, so, okay, so this, this core versus supplementary thing, I sort of came up with this idea, and not to say that I'm like the person who came up with it, of course, but um, what, when I was in Taiwan, I went to the Mandarin Training Center uh, at National Taiwan Normal University. Um, but I knew that the program at ICLP, the International Chinese Language Program, which is like right down the street, is the premier place to learn Chinese. Now, there's a few other schools that are in that same category. There's IUP in Beijing. Uh, there's one called Princeton in Beijing. There's a few others. Um, but ICLP was like, I guess the original school like that. It was founded by Stanford, I believe, in the 60s, maybe. And it was where people like diplomats and, you know, uh, business people and lawyers and academics went to study Chinese for decades. Uh, and still is. I mean, there's still, um, it's a fantastic school. And so what I did while I was at MTC, because I didn't, I was on scholarship. So I worked, I was, um, you know, I did some like English tutoring and stuff like that, but because I was on scholarship, um, I didn't have to work full time. I could spend most of my time lear learning Chinese. Um, and I, so I started like studying, what do they do at ICLP? Uh, cause I noticed the curriculum was quite different from what they do at MTC. Uh, and so I wanted to try to emulate that as much as possible. So the differences are, um, well, I mean, there's a lot of differences. So ICLP has amazing teachers. Not that MTC doesn't. Uh, some of them teach it both, actually. Um, but the the teaching approach at ICLP just can't be replicated. Um, what you do at ICLP is you 
take three classes per semester. And it may be two only in the summer, I'm not sure, but I think it's three classes per semester, one hour per day per class. So you have a core textbook and then you have two supplementary textbooks. And then you also have one hour of one-on-one -on -one instruction. So it's a super intensive, um, you, your, even your group classes don't have any more than four people. Um, oh, cool. Attending MTC on scholarship this fall. That's great. It's a good school. I mean, you know, when I say ICLP is the best, it is, but MTC, I, I had no complaints about MTC. Um, MTC is great because you have, you have tons of teachers. So if you start a class and you decide that the teacher is not a good fit for you, I think it's within the first week you can switch to a different teacher in the same class. Um, yeah, it's good. And the social aspect is great. Um, the thing with ICLP is, so you have those three hours of class and you have one hour of one-on-one, -on -one, but you're expected to basically have already mastered all the material in the lesson for the day for each of those classes. You're not allowed to look at your textbook when you show up to class. You have to have it all in your head. And class is all about drills. So the teacher will like get you to use certain sentence patterns that you learned in that lesson. Uh, and you have to like, you know, be able to spit it out without looking at your textbook. The fact that you only have four people in the class means that there is a ton of pressure to have everything prepared. Like if you don't have it together, you're going to look really bad in front of your other classmates. So, uh, there's just a ton of pressure on the students there. And so they, even though they spend four hours a day in class, uh, from what I've been told and Ash, Ash went to ICLP and he taught there um he taught like a course on chinese characters for several years um from what he says they give you so much work to do after class that you can't possibly finish it every day so they they say you have four hours of class and eight hours of homework but it's really more like uh more homework than you can actually finish so super intensive mtc is very different so mtc you take one uh textbook per semester and you do that textbook for two to three hours per day, depending on if you're in the regular class or the uh, intensive class. And you get maybe an hour or two at the most of homework. Most days I was able to finish my homework in like 30 minutes to an hour. So you've got two to three hours of class, possibly an hour of extracurricular stuff if you want, but that stuff, I mean, it's all fairly optional. Um... And then uh, maybe about an hour on average of homework. So the workload is much lighter. Um, you're not expected to have everything memorized when you get to class. Class is for, at MTC, class is for teaching the material in the book. At ICLP, you teach yourself the material in the book, and then your teacher drills you on it um, to, to make it more automatic so that you get a lot of practice speaking. Um that's another thing. ICLP is very focused on oral proficiency. Um, and I actually, there's a passage in this. I, I mentioned this, I think it was in the pronunciation course that I mentioned this passage. Um, but they talk about, ah, here it is. So this is an ICLP textbook. Let's see if I can get it to show up well. So new radio plays. It's actually old radio plays. I mean, I think these were recorded in the 80s. Um, but it's still a great textbook, if you can get it. Um, I'm just going to read this, because when I found this book and read this, it was like, uh, it opened up a whole different way of, of studying with textbooks for me. So, uh, let's see. It should be emphasized that these materials are designed for training in the spoken language. Therefore, the tapes are of primary importance. The glosses are secondary, and the texts of the plays are only of tertiary significance. Okay, so most people, when they study a textbook, they, what do you do? You sit down, you either read the text first and then learn all the vocabulary words that you don't know, or you cram all the vocabulary words and then read the text, and then you might listen to the audio some along the way, right? Uh, this is telling you it should be exactly the opposite. The audio is primary. 
the glosses, that is the vocabulary words, are secondary. So what you should be doing is listening to the audio, um, finding any words that you don't understand in the glosses, in the vocabulary section, and only as a, a, recourse, a last recourse, if you can't uh, make sense of what you're hearing, then you go look at the text um, to, to fill in the blanks. So, and, and it's, it's, it's like a paradigm shift, really. Um, you really start to master the speech a lot more, um, and you get a much better handle on being able to, um, uh, well, for listening and for, for speaking. So, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing cause it's, you know, like six paragraphs, but, um, the first objective in training is listening comprehension. The second objective is to use the speech forms of the plays, because it's radio plays, right? Insofar as is appropriate in the judgment of the teacher as modal, the utterances for expanding the student's active spoken language competence. Um, text can, of course, also be used for reading and writing practice, but such use should be subordinated to the oral, oral functions of the material. So again, listening and speaking is the primary thing. Um, ideally, the student should begin preparation of a lesson by listening to an entire play without stopping the tape. Each play is only nine or ten minutes long. Attention should at first be concentrated not on individual words, but on getting as much as possible of the gist of the action and narration. First exposure to the entire play should be followed by a second and a third time through. Perhaps stopping occasionally to catch up mentally with the flow of speech, but without reserving the tape for repeated listening to difficult passages. Uh, so this was published in the 80s. They're talking about tapes here, but audio files, you know, same, same deal. Only after several runs through the entire play should assistance be sought in the glossary. So you, you want to listen to it several times before you even start looking at the vocabulary words for help. Students at a somewhat lower level of oral competence, listening competence in the language, however, might find it more effective to break the play into several sections of two or three minutes uh, each for more detailed listening before attempting to comprehend the entire play. Um, after all problems of comprehension have been overcome, and thus perhaps after one or two classroom sessions on the play, the student should listen to the entire play several more times to gain thorough familiarity with the new words and constructions introduced in the play. The text of the play should not be used as a direct aid to listening comprehension. On the contrary, students should find it useful after having thoroughly understood a play orally, listening, to follow the text while listening as an aid to improving reading speed. All right, I think that's that's enough to get the gist. So, um, I I took that to to really like I, I that passage really informed how I approached studying with textbooks from then on. Uh, and this is an intermediate book. I mean, it's uh, well, it's kind of upper intermediate, I guess. You, you're getting to the point where you're listening to uh, simple plays and dialogues that were actually broadcast on Taiwanese radio, uh, in the eighties. So, um, you, you're getting to a pretty good level once you're here, but yeah, I found that very useful. Um, so let me see. Okay. So what to look for in a textbook at the intermediate and advanced level, I would say based on that audio, good audio. Now, not every book that I'm going to talk about today has uh, audio recordings, but that's fine. You want to, the core of what you choose, the core textbooks you choose should have audio. And you should go through them in that way where you're, most textbooks have, you know, dialogues mostly. Um, or it could be like a, a, a reading passage, but that also has audio. So you want to go through those and, in that way of focusing on the audio looking up words that you don't understand after you've listened a few times, making as much sense of the audio as you can, and only then looking at the text and using that for reading practice once you have everything down. Uh, it really, it'll change the way you learn Chinese. I mean, it's, it's that big of a difference versus doing it the way most people do it. Um, 
and it's actually something I talk about a little bit in the, or actually quite a bit, but from a different angle in the pronunciation course of like how to use audio, how to, how to process it as thoroughly as possible using, um, like shadowing and, um, chorusing techniques. Um, but those same things can, of course, I, in the pronunciation course, I talk about that in the context of like using TV shows and movies, but the same thing can be done with, uh, with textbooks. So, excuse me. Um, so, oh, okay. So when I was at MTC, what I ended up doing is, like I said, studying what they do at ICLP and trying to replicate it as much as possible. Of course, I couldn't replicate the teaching methods, but I figured I could at least choose textbooks that they were using at a similar level of, of what I was studying at the time at MTC. And uh, so I would use whatever was my classroom text at MTC would be my core textbook. And then I would choose uh, books around the same level or maybe like a... Um, you know, half a level above or whatever, like, um, as my supplementary textbooks. And I usually also did some classical Chinese on the side too. So like I said in the, uh, the video on classical Chinese a few weeks ago, pronunciation course from outlier is great. I've been doing it for a week and implemented chorusing right away. This is a game changer. Yeah. Uh, chorusing really is, uh, it's a powerful technique. So for anyone who's watching this, who, um, you know, the pronunciation course isn't just about pronunciation. It, it, it is, but it's also about teaching a new way of, of approaching learning language and chorusing and shadowing really like once you have the basic sounds of the language down, chorusing and shadowing is where it's at. It's going to improve your pronunciation and accent and, um, just improve your fluency it'll help you acquire grammar patterns more easily. I mean, it's, it's a whole new way of, uh, of approaching it. So if you're not in the pronunciation course and you want to check that stuff out, um, it's on our website. Uh, and right now we are running a Memorial day sale. Uh, I know it's past Memorial day now it's Wednesday here, but we just kept it running for a few more days. Um, so everything is 20% off. So, uh, anyone who's, you know, interested in that, um, you know, you can get a discount right now. So, um, so yeah, I, while I was at MTC, I was, I was trying to study ICLP textbooks. Now the thing with ICLP is that not all of their textbooks are available for purchase. Some of them are only available for ICLP students. Uh, others are available, but the audio is hard to find. Um, so some of these I'm going to recommend, uh, I'll mention when it's hard to find the audio. Um, but there, there's one at least that you probably won't be able to find unless you find a used copy somewhere in Taiwan. Uh, but it's also, I didn't even use the book myself. I'm just, it's a good book, so I'm going to recommend it. But um, at, it's a pretty advanced book. So once you're at that level, there's, there's other options that I'll also recommend. So I just wanted to bring it to show you. Um, so I guess let's get into it. Oh, what I was going to say is by doing, by studying this way, by having these supplemental texts that I was studying on the side, uh, after two semesters at MTC, I was basically so far ahead of the other students. And this is not like a bragging point, but I was just, I was working really hard and I was so far ahead of the other students in my class. And I did so well on my test scores at the end of the semester that they let me skip two semesters of class. So it really like propelled me forward very quickly to, to approach things like this. Um, I don't know of anyone else that, I mean, I'm sure there's been other people that were able to skip two levels, but I had to get like special permission. They were like really skeptical that I could handle it. And I was like, I skipped from, if anyone's been to MTC or is familiar with the curriculum, I skipped from what they call book three, which they've changed the books they use, but the old practical audio visual, uh, is it? Yeah. Practical audio visual Chinese books. So this is book five, um, book, I skipped from book three, 
I think we did the first two or three lessons of book four. So I skipped the rest of book four. I skipped Far East book three, which is usually what you do after book four. So it's a different textbook series. Far East three. And I skipped all the way to mini radio plays, which I'm going to talk about here, um, which is at the same level as book book five of, of practical audiovisual. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, th this approaching things this way was so effective that it really like, yeah, I was able to skip two semesters of, of intensive language classes. So I guess let me get into it. So uh, like I said, this is book five. This is the only one I still own. Uh, I studied books two and three in the first part of book four at MTC, but I, I don't have those anymore, or, or if I do, they're in storage somewhere. Um, I think these are still available. Whatever textbook series that they've used to replace this uh, is also good. I, I looked at it when they first came out. Um, so if you're in Taiwan or you're on... Uh, let me bring up my... Uh, Let me see if I can bring up a uh, a window that I can type in. I'm going to give you a few places that you can go for textbooks if you're in Taiwan. Um, let me see. And places that you can order these if you're not in Taiwan. So, sorry guys, I'm... Uh, Oh, that's the wrong thing. Hang on. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right, there we go. Um, so if you're in Taiwan, you can go to the Shida bookstore. It's on Shida Road, close to, close to the MTC, also called the Lucky Bookstore. Um, if you're not, and there's other ones too. I mean, each university that has a Chinese language program is going to have you know their own bookstore, but the one at Shida has a bunch of stuff. So. Um, if you're not in Taiwan, most of these you can get at books.com.tw, uh, and they ship internationally, and the shipping is is uh, reasonable. Some of these you can get even on Amazon in the U.S. or U.K. You know wherever you are. There's a few of these books, and I'll mention them as I come across them. That um, there's different editions available in Taiwan versus what's available you know elsewhere. Um, so if you're in Taiwan, get the Taiwanese one, cause it's going to be a lot cheaper and it's the same exact material. Uh, if you're outside of Taiwan, it may be easier to get, you know, the, the one that's available elsewhere, but I, I'll mention those as I come to them. Um, so let me switch the scene back. Okay. <clears throat> so like I said, these are good. The replacement is good. Uh, and it's a basic, it's a standard, you know, it's a pretty standard textbook. Like you get, uh, you know, uh, let me see if I can get that to come up. There we go. You get a dialogue or a text to work with. You get uh, vocabulary. You get a lot of proverbs and common sayings. You get grammar exercises. There's ton I mean, there's tons of good stuff in here. Uh, lots of exercises to do. The audio quality is really good. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on this one because it's one that anyone studied in Taiwan knows, and it's it's a standard like intermediate textbook. So I think book three is where you start getting into intermediate territory uh, of this series. Um, and I'm going to stick right now with what I would call core textbooks, and then I'll I'll mention when something is supplementary. Um, Taiwan today. So this one is one of the ones that it's available overseas in a different edition, but the content, as far as I know, is the same. Uh, this is by uh, Deng Xiuxin, uh, who's a professor at, at National Taiwan Normal University, where I went. He wasn't one of my professors, 
Um, but this textbook is just fantastic. It's focused on Taiwan. So if that's, you know, not something that's interesting to you, you can easily give it a miss, but, um, it's, it's really good. Oh, and it's got, I should, I should mention this. It's got simplified and traditional. So here's simplified, I think. I can't really see the display, but, and then traditional on the facing page. So, and the topics are like, and the, the audio is very good. It comes with a CD. Um, the lessons are things like, okay, exercise in the park, visiting a night market, eating at a food stand, tea and Chinese people, marriage and matchmakers, Taipei is so crowded, roasted students, it's a pun in Chinese, Kaohsiung, uh, religions and folk beliefs, the excitement of festivals, strong women, masked cyclists, separated by the strait, so cross strait uh, uh, affairs, Taiwan community and language, economy in Taiwan. Um, it even has sections that like explain certain things about Taiwanese Mandarin. Um, so it'll explain like certain grammar constructions that are unique to Taiwanese Mandarin that you won't hear in the mainland, uh, that are like, uh, basically influences from Minanhua uh, or Taiwanese as they call it. Um, <clears throat> the, te the textbook is really good. It's mostly focused on, uh, I mean, it's, it's not conversational. It's essays that you're reading. Um, so this would be a good supplement. Like if you're doing book four of the practical audio visual series, this is about the same level. Um, and it's just really, it's, it's one of the best textbooks I used. Um, and it, it progresses fairly quickly. So at the beginning of the textbook, you're like, you're a good, comfortable intermediate level toward the end. It, it wasn't too long after this, I think, that I started reading manga and stuff like that. But I could have started much earlier. It was just that I didn't... I was really textbook focused for a long time. Um, but yeah, Taiwan Today. The cover looks completely different in the in the version. I think it's published by Yale. Or maybe it's Chung and Sui. I can't remember. Um, but the cover looks different. The content's the same. Really, really good textbook. Um... A level up from that, and I would consider this to be a good core textbook, is many radio plays. So this is, it's like a new version of this. The difference is, this one are plays that were actually recorded from Taiwanese radio. These were written specifically for the textbook. But it's a really good textbook. Um... The, the only real complaint that I had was that it's a little over the top with like having to force a like moral lesson into each play. Uh, but that's fine. I mean, the, the language used is good. And this is like, I would say, if you finish this book, you probably have no problem listening to the radio. Uh, like understanding stuff on the radio. You can probably start to watch TV shows and stuff like that. Um, it it teaches like good colloquial, uh, not Taiwanese Mandarin in the sense of like, I mean, it, it's standard Mandarin, but as used in Taiwan. Um, but it's just, it's fantastic. The audio quality is great. Um, the voice acting is fantastic. Uh, it's a really super useful textbook and it's the, the plays start out at like six minutes long or something like that in the beginning. And then toward the end, they're like 15 minutes. Uh, and you learn just, I forget how many vocabulary words are in this. You learn a ton. Uh, so let me talk about vocabulary though for a minute, cause, uh, that's, one of the biggest things at the intermediate level is you have to learn a ton of vocabulary. Um, Chinese just, there's so much vocabulary to learn. So, uh, 
what I used to do is I would approach it the way I, I mentioned earlier, where you focus on the audio and then you look at the vocabulary words to figure out, you know, to fill in the blanks of what you're missing. Um, but then also once I had learned those words, I would add them to my Plico flashcards. Uh, and maybe I can do another video on this, but, uh, I would just, you know, use the handwriting, oops, sorry. I would use the handwriting input on Plico, look up the word and then add it, you know, to my flashcard deck and review it. And it got to where I, I had something like 8,000 flashcards or something like that, or 10,000. And eventually I just deleted them all. Like, I think this is something that people get obsessed over their flashcard decks. Um, or, you know, you go a few months without reviewing and then you've got hundreds of reviews waiting for you and it just seems overwhelming. Or, or even I had one time where I had like 2000 reviews waiting for me when I came back, uh, just delete it and start over. Like if you're, if it's a word you need to learn, you're going to come across it again. So just, if you get to the point that you've got an overwhelming flashcard deck, just toss it out like and rebuild. Uh, it's, it's not a big deal. It's not a, as big of a deal as it seems. Uh, there's actually a user on Chinese forums, one of the admins, uh, or admins, um, Imran. And I got that idea from him where he said, look, just, just delete it. Um, but yeah, just as you learn the vocabulary words, I really recommend adding them to Plico. I know a lot of people like Anki. I'm a huge Anki fan too, a uh, flashcard program, but the ease of creating flashcards in Plico just makes it like you just look up a word and press the plus button. So if you don't have the like flashcard module on Plico, I, I recommend getting it. It's part of their like basic package, I think, which is like 10 or $15. And it comes with a lot of good stuff like handwriting recognition, which is amazing. Um, the flashcard module and some other stuff. Um, so you can, you can add, you know, a few dozen words in the space of a few minutes. Whereas with Anki, you have to type in all the definitions and stuff cause it's not pre-made. Um, so I really recommend, um, that I'm looking for Taiwanese Mandarin to be honest. Yeah. So, well, this is the video for you. I mean, I, I have some mainland textbooks. I have some that are in simplified Chinese, but I studied in Taiwan, and so most of this is going to be, um, is going to be that. Okay, so this is a good. Okay, good point. Most people would say to stop using textbooks when you're upper, intermediate to advanced, and just consume natural native content. Okay, yeah, there's there's absolutely something to be said for that, and I do like I said earlier in the pronunciation course, I talk about like how to use TV shows and movies uh, as you know basically as your textbooks. But there's also something to be said for content that is specifically curated by expert teachers to quickly push you to a higher level. Um, and so, yeah, of course, when you get to the level that you're comfortable starting to do native materials, you should, absolutely. Um, and you can even, textbooks can even become like a secondary thing at that point. Um, but they're still super useful. And I'll, there's one textbook author that's going to come up several times because she just makes outstanding stuff uh, for advanced learners. Um, and it's the, the good thing about some of these textbooks, and I, I would say something to look for in a good textbook at this level is, does it start to wean well two things does it start to wean you off of english or whatever your you know lang your language is that your textbook is in um so like one that i'm going to talk about in a minute the independent reader in the beginning a lot of the definitions are in english and some of them are in chinese as you get toward the end of the textbook all of the definitions are in chinese and all of the selections are actually from uh publications for native speakers. So this, I mean, once you get to a certain point, yeah, you can just use stuff for native speakers. But if you really want to advance quickly, 
uh, the independent reader, which we'll get to in a few minutes, will get you there very quickly because they've chosen stuff that is for native speakers. Um, and they basically lead you through it to the point where if you finish the independent reader, you can read pretty much anything you'd ever want to be able to read in Chinese. Um, so yeah, I don't disagree, but, uh, I think, um, a good series of textbooks, which is what I'm, I'm trying to recommend here is, uh, will help you get there even more quickly. So, okay. So that's many radio plays. Like I said, is great. There's a bunch of good vocabulary in there. Um, it'll really improve your listening because it's all, you know, it's, uh, good voice acting and, and whatnot. So, um, new radio plays, which I've already talked about. I would say this is a little harder than many, many radio plays, even though it's a lower level, but it's harder because it's for native, like the plays were originally for native speakers and the recording quality isn't so great. Like it, it's, like I said, it was recorded in the eighties. It's pretty fuzzy. Um, the two textbooks are fairly similar though. So I, I won't spend too much time cause I have a lot of textbooks to go through. Um, okay. Now we're starting to get more into upper intermediate getting to advanced. Um, Talks on Chinese culture. So this is an ICLP textbook, but it's also available. Um, I forget which. Anyway, it's available on um, on Amazon, and I, th I think it's either Yale or Princeton um, University Press. So this is not the. So th there's a textbook I'm going to get to, to in a minute that is considered like the cornerstone of ICLP's program. Uh, this one is the precursor to that. It's um, actually, if anyone here has studied Japanese, if you're familiar with Tobira, uh, it's kind of a similar um, style of textbook as Tobira, which is awesome. So what you have is... First, you get like a reading, uh, sorry, a dialogue. So, uh, so you have this dialogue, and it's about different aspects of Chinese culture. So, uh, traditional Chinese social system. Um, studying languages and studying Chinese. Um, Chinese language and writing, uh, China's, um, agricultural and economic, oh, uh, ag sorry, Chinese, China's agricultural economy, uh, and industrial economy, I guess. Um, I didn't, I didn't prepare this very well, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, China's government and, uh, governance. So, each, each chapter is a different topic. Uh, you're getting into more advanced sort of like educated um, topics, I guess. You know, it's not your standard like how do you get to the mall, you know, stuff. You're getting to where you're starting to discuss serious topics. Um, so the, the lessons are basically structured as you have a dialogue. I think maybe two dialogues. And the dialogues are basically... Uh, set up to be like between a student and their professor. Um, so the idea is to get you ready to start like attending lectures uh, in Taiwan, for example, uh, and exposing you to the type of vocabulary and the type of speech structures that you're going to encounter um, if you're taking classes in Chinese or attending lectures. Uh, the second part of the lesson is a reading selection about the same topic. So you're going to see a lot of repeated vocabulary and you're going to get a lot more like related vocabulary. Uh, each section has a, a massive vocabulary list. Like I said, intermediate level, you're going to be learning a ton of new vocabulary. So, and then the third section is another dialogue again about the same topic again between, you know, student and professor. Uh, and the whole book is like that. It's something like, yeah, 12 lessons in that style. 
and it is just, it's a little dated. The content is a little dated. Um, you get a lot of stuff that's, uh, let's see. Damn, I thought this was tomorrow. <laughs> Welcome. Um, <clears throat> what was I going to say? Oh, you get a lot of stuff that's a little dated. Some stuff about, like, cross straight relationship that's a little that's pretty dated uh, i think this textbook was also written in the 80s but if you can get yeah 1987 if you can get past the like dated content it's a really really good textbook uh so iclp this is their core textbook at level four um so you're like i said pre-advanced um this is uh i highly recommend it and the audio the audio that I had was kind of old, not great, but good enough. The audio with the, the one that's available, the version that's available outside of Taiwan, I, I hope is better, uh, but I, I don't really know. Uh, I didn't even know they had a version of this outside of Taiwan. I was looking for this for the longest time, and I finally found it like at a used bookstore in Taipei. So that's it's all written up, and it's mostly not my handwriting, but... Um, yeah, talks on Chinese culture. If you're wanting to get into like a level, not necessarily where you're thinking about going to university in, in China or Taiwan, but where you would be able to, or you would be able to like, for instance, sit in on a TED talk or something like that. There's a bunch of TED talks in Chinese, by the way. Um, this will sort of be pushing you in that direction where you, where you're able to start handling stuff like that. Um, a similar book, and I would not recommend, recommend this as a core textbook, but it's a good one. Um, 20 Lectures on Chinese Culture. And I think this is maybe the precursor to Talks on Chinese Culture. Um, or perhaps they were based on the same original material. I read something about this a few years ago. Um, that they, I think they were based on the same, like, class notes or something that some teacher had compiled. And just two people wrote two different textbooks on similar topics. Uh, this one is uh, also available outside of Taiwan. This is what it looks like in Taiwan, and it's about 10 bucks. Uh, it looks completely different outside of Taiwan, and it's uh, maybe $20 or something like that. Uh, it's all reading focused. There's no dialogues or anything of that nature, but it's good stuff. Again, it's uh, dated. I mean, you have stuff like, not to get too political, but you have things like, Terms like free China, zhuo Zhongguo. So <clears throat> it's fairly dated, but uh, the content is really good. So if you're looking for like, um, I would say this is about the same level as like mini radio plays or book four of the practical audio visual series. Um, if you're looking for a supplemental like reader type thing that's focused on like, cultural knowledge about China, this is a good one. Uh, in that vein, I picked this one up earlier. This is, uh, this particular one is Zhongguo de Feng Su Xi Guan. So, Chinese Customs and Traditions. Um, this is part of a series. They're, they're, nearly all of them are like yellow covers like this. And I think there's like 10. I have seven. I only brought one today. but And they go from like an intermediate level, like book three or so in the practical audiovisual series, um, maybe book four, but like that level. And they go all the way up to like short stories and uh, essays intended for native speakers. So it's a great, there's no audio for these, but it's a great supplemental reading uh, course and it's you learn tons of like there's one that's Chinese folk tales there's one that's um, or I think there's two that are Chinese folk tales there's two that are Chinese customs and traditions I forget what the other ones are but it's all like it's tons of cultural knowledge uh, historical knowledge uh, famous stories from Chinese history and stuff like that so this is a fantastic series um, this is volume two I don't think it's, I don't think it lists all the other volumes. Um, 
Now, I didn't actually do the entire series, but I know people who did and uh, just raved about it. So, um, I would say, yeah, it doesn't have pinyin. It has like uh, what's called tongyong pinyin, which is, uh, yeah, if I can get the camera to focus. It's a romanization scheme that was used in Taiwan for a short time. Um, but it's easy to learn. It's similar to Han Yu Pinyin. And it's also got, you know, Zhu uh, Yin Fu Hao, so, which is useful to know anyway. Um, but yeah, these books are awesome. And not political, like some of the other ones. Um, so, moving on from, like, the talks on Chinese culture book. The next book at ICLP, and the next book that I studied... And this is, I would recommend anyone that's at a, getting into an advanced level, this is your book. This is Thought and Society, Sixiang Yu Shou Hui. This is the cornerstone textbook at ICLP. As far as I know, everyone that goes there has to take this. Even if you're, you know, supposedly at a higher level, they put you in this book if you haven't studied it before anyway. Um, and it's easily the best textbook I ever used. Um, what was interesting is after I finished this book, I decided I was going to read my first like serious, serious book in Chinese. And it was one on like an intro to paleography. And there's a chapter in this book called Xianhua Wenzi He Yuyan. So, uh, a chat or a casual talk about writing and language. Let's see if I can get it to... Yeah, there we go. So that's chapter one. This intro to paleography book, like, the first chapter was absolutely chock full of the exact vocabulary that I used here. And some of the exact same, not exact same sentences, but really similar sentences. So it was really interesting reading that after having gone through this textbook. Um, So this, I believe, is ten lessons. Um... This is one of ICLP's textbooks that you can get anywhere. Uh, It's available in in stores. Uh, It's available... I don't think there's a U.S. version of it. I think this is only... I could be wrong, but I think this is only in Taiwan. It's published by SMC Publishing. I think that's showing up. SMC Publishing. Uh, The audio is not available for purchase, but... If you Google Chinese forums and Thought and Society audio, there's somebody that posted, you know, uh, found all the audio, and I think may have even cleared it with ICLP uh, to post that stuff online. So if you have this book or or if you don't have it but want to get it, the audio is available for download online. Um, and it's just such a good book. The, the topics are... Um, I said writing in language there's one uh modern people's health problems you learn a ton of like i would say medical terminology but stuff that anybody should know um chinese people's uh i guess superstitions would be the translation um the feeling of responsibility that university students have that's one of them Um, the societal value of old novels, um, the, like, uh, what people think about geography, the land, space, uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not the greatest translator right now, but, um, Chinese, uh, oh, the special characteristics of Chinese thought, uh, Chinese population, uh, oh, uh, economic, uh, economic thought, economic development, um, and then the last chapter is, uh, talking about pre-Qin thought, so early Chinese philosophy, so, as you can tell, it's serious topics. It's um, it's intended to get you to the point where you can have 
serious discussions about, you know, uh, things that are of interest to a general, well-educated audience. Um, it's a super useful book. I think I went through it like three times. I went through it once self-studying. Um, I went through it again the next semester as my main textbook because I just wanted to go through a class having this as my, as my main textbook and have a teacher that had been teaching it for, I think he had been teaching for 20 years at that point. Uh, and had memorized the book backwards and forwards, uh, and would drill us on it. Um, and then I reviewed it again after that. Um, so it's, it's, when you get to this book, like milk it for everything you can, it's worth it. It's a, it's a great book. Sorry, I bumped the microphone. Uh, let me get back to questions real quick. Um, I've been studying Mandarin for 15 months on my own. My vocabulary is about 5,000 and I can read basic, stu basic stuff. Haven't outputted yet. Thoughts on where to go from here? Output. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a proponent of, of not speaking. I'm absolutely a proponent of speaking. I can do another video on this. It's a whole different topic, but, um, I know it's a popular thing with some people to not speak, not try to have conversations or anything for a long time at the beginning. I, I don't think that's the way to go. I think you should master pronunciation in the beginning and get lots of practice speaking. Um, but like I said, I, I, it's a whole different topic. I, I'll add that to the topics list though, because that's a really good one. I've only immersed in native content and didn't use textbooks. Okay. Well, I can only understand basic Cartoons and basic dialogues, listening still isn't great. What would you recommend to actively tackle Mandarin listening? Uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, I'd recommend checking out our pronunciation course because it's not just about pronunciation. It also teaches you, uh, the exercises I teach you will really improve your listening ability. Um, yeah, so these are all good topics. I'll have to address them in another, in another video, though, because they're a little tangential. Uh, to what I'm talking about today. Suggestions for secondary books materials that have a specific focus on grammar structures, both in more con conventional textbook and non-textbook formats. Uh, yeah, I don't have that kind of stuff with me today. Um, personally, I didn't learn that much about grammar. Like sometimes I had to memorize a sentence pattern or whatever for a test, but um, my knowledge of Chinese grammar actually isn't all that great. What I focused on was listening and imitating, imitating the way people talk. And if I didn't understand something that I heard someone say, I would, you know, ask a friend to explain it and I would try to use it myself. And what I, and I would do, I did a lot of chorusing and shadowing. And, uh, especially I did tons of shadowing with thought and society. So the, the, um, recordings for each lesson are like 10 minutes long, something like that, 10 to 15 minutes long. And so I would just like shadow, um, I must have shadowed every lesson in the book for, I don't know, a few hours per lesson over, over time. Um, and you just, you develop the muscle memory. We talk about this also in the pronunciation course, but if you're doing this like chorusing and shadowing, you'll develop muscle memory so that it feels wrong to say something with incorrect grammar, the same way it does in your native language. Um... So specific resources on grammar, I have some. I'll have to do another video on that. That's that's a good topic for a video. Um, when you get really advanced, not necessarily really advanced, but when you get to an advanced level, this book is amazing. Expressions of written Chinese, but this is specifically about you know shu mian yu, so written style Chinese. Uh, I'll I'll try to talk about that more later in this video, but um, it's a really good one to improve your writing. Um, let's see. Working full time as an MD, have two hours a day for Chinese, looking to be as good as I can by 2023, move to China or Taiwan. Well, I mean, it, it sounds like what you're doing is working. So I don't want to say like, you know, uh, if you're, if you've been immersing and you're able to watch cartoons and stuff and understand it, that's, you know, it's working, uh, but I would recommend, um, you know, getting more output practice, uh, or even get a tutor that you meet with once, once a week or something like that, that you can practice having a conversation with. Uh, there was a video a while back. I wish I could find it, but there was this guy who did nothing but watch Chinese cartoons and TV shows for like two years. 
And at the end of two years, he had his first ever conversation and he was able to basically speak. It wasn't great, but he was able to communicate. His pronunciation was decent. His tones were mostly right. Uh, I mean, he made some mistakes, of course, but I mean, it, it is a way of going about it. I don't think it's the most efficient way of going about it. Um, I think you should practice what you want to get good at. Um, but again, like I said, it's uh, that's a whole different uh, topic. So, uh, does Baidu and Google Translate help with using Plico? Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. Um, if you could clarify, I'll try to come back to that. Uh, any book for Samwen or Xian Dai Shi? Uh, actually, I th if I remember correctly, like I said, I don't have the entire series of this, uh, this, but I think one or two of the highest level books in this series are about Sanwen, like essays. Xian Dai Shi, I'm not really sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Poetry has never really been my thing. So... Yeah, I, I don't really know about that. But output topic, I would love to tune in to that. Gonna buy your course this week. Tried two to three I talk I lessons, and I could say some basic stuff. Gonna ramp up the output. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, I've never used I. I think it's I talk I or I talky. I met one of their investors a few years ago. Real super nice guy. Uh, but it seems like a really good concept. So yeah, I would recommend you know trying to get more of that type of practice in. Uh, Speaking helps improve listening. Yeah, so if you're gonna if you're gonna sign up for the pronunciation course, I talk about that in the course. Um, I would say to an extent, yeah. Speaking, um, if you can say it, then you'll understand it when you hear it. If you're saying it correctly, right? So we talk in the pronunciation course about installing a correct mental model of the language in your head. So if you don't do the right kind of practice then what you the version of Chinese that you have in your head is something that you have sort of made up yourself uh, and not the way Chinese is actually spoken by native speakers. If you practice the right way, you'll install the correct mental model. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then in that case, yes, um, anything you're able to say, you should also be able to understand. Um, but I knew plenty of people when I was in Taiwan who could talk all day and they were quite fluent. But when I say fluent, I mean, their speech flowed. I didn't mean, I don't mean that it was good. Um, so people could basically understand them, but these people like, they couldn't understand native speakers talking back to them, right? Because their pronunciation was all over the place and the, what they were hearing native speakers say was not in line with the mental model of the language that they had installed. Um, so even though they could say a bunch of stuff, they couldn't understand the same stuff said back to them by a native speaker. Uh, so yeah, I would say, um, speaking helps to improve listening. Yes. As long as you are doing it the right way and have the right mental model installed. But yeah, like I said, um, that's that's something we spend quite a lot of time on in the pronunciation course. Um, okay, so I'll get back to the core textbooks in a minute. I wanted to talk about some of the other supplemental ones that I have. Um, so a really common one that people study at MTC is learning Chinese with newspaper one. Um they do this after, excuse me, sorry. Uh, they do this after many radio plays. So this is a little bit, I've gone a little bit past this one already in the, you know, as far as book recommendations. Uh, after many radio plays, or if you do practical audiovisual Chinese book five instead of many radio plays, which is perfectly fine if you don't want to do the radio plays thing. Um, this is the next book at ICLP. I forget what level they teach it at. I mean, sorry, at NTC. I don't remember what level they teach it at, at ICLP, but I think it's maybe level five. Anyway, it's very good. It's a bunch of newspaper selections from mostly 99, but I think up to like 2004 or something like that. And it's actual like, um, 
clippings from newspapers. So you can see. Um, <clears throat> and it just it gets you really used to the way they write in newspapers. Um, I will say that I showed this book to one of my Taiwanese friends and she went, huh, this must be 20 years ago. I was like, yeah, how do you know? Well, they write like 20 years ago. So uh, apparently the style of newspaper writing has changed a bit since then, but it's still, there's three textbooks uh, in this series. This is book one. They have one, two, and three. They're really good supplemental books once you get to that level where you can start tackling Chinese newspapers. Um, another one is, as I said, I was going to make sure to include some uh, simplified Readings from the People's Daily. So this is by Vivian Xu, or Vivian Ling, uh, as she went by for most of her career, I believe. Um, anything that you can find made by Vivian Ling, get it. It's absolutely outstanding. And this is um, like the, the textbook or the newspaper book I just showed you. This is actual, you know, news clips from Chinese newspapers, from mainland Chinese newspapers. Um, you also get a handwritten transcription in traditional Chinese. I think most people, when this book was published, most people were learning traditional Chinese, and so this was like meant to get them comfortable with the simplified characters. Of course, that's changed now, where most people are learning uh, simplified Chinese, but... Uh, either way, this, this book is great and it's got, you know, uh, a character index in the back that shows you traditional and simplified for each one that you learn in the book. Um, it's, uh, of course, I mean, again, this was published in the eighties. Um, so the, the news, the news is old. But it's still going to get you used to, you know, the language used in, especially in PRC uh, newspapers. So, um, let's see. Did I attend ICLP? Any courses, textbooks you recommend above Sishiang Yu Shouhui? Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a minute, actually. There's a few more. Um I didn't attend ICLP, but I did, um, you probably missed the beginning of this video. I did, I went to the MTC and I based my class choice and my supplemental textbook choices on what they were doing at ICLP. And I talked to a lot of people that went to ICLP. So, uh, I know a decent about, uh, amount about what they do there curriculum wise. Um, so... Yeah, so that was the um, the PRC newspaper one. Another one for advanced students that are learning simplified Chinese is this Advanced Chinese Intention, Strategy, and Communication. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, I, I bought this when I lived in Taiwan. I never actually went through it. Uh, I've, I've looked at it quite a bit. It's really good. Um, it has a, a big variety of different types of, um, let me actually get to the lessons. There's a bunch of like front matter. Um, there's a big variety of different types of text. There's like little, you know, short paragraphs, there's short stories. They have stuff in both simplified and traditional. Um, they talk a lot. So going back to the grammar question, this one talks a lot about different grammar structures, um, <clears throat> which I guess most textbooks do. Uh, it's just not something that I personally ever focused on because for me, like chorusing and shadowing was enough for me that I didn't actually need to pay too much attention to like uh, learning the grammar rules. But I, I understand that not everybody likes to learn that way, that some people like to read the explanations. So um, yeah, this is just a really good textbook with a lot of different variety in subject matter and content type there's short stories there's all kinds of stuff so um if you're learning simplified chinese this is a good one uh even if you're learning traditional but you want to learn to read simplified because it has the text in both traditional and simplified so you can compare uh 
like I said, I never used it, but it's good. And it comes with uh, an audio, you know, a CD with audio on it. Um, any books on Chudu? Uh, that may be a different <laughs> topic for a different video. Um, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> I don't actually have any uh, experience living in China, so anything I would say would be just kind of hearsay. Um, so, okay, so moving on, uh, more textbooks. And I'm, I'm getting close to the end, guys. This is going, once again, longer than I thought it was going to. But uh, this is one of the ones, this is another ICLP textbook, Aspects of Life in Taiwan, a Modern Chinese Reader. This is going to be hard to find. They don't sell it outside of ICLP. So basically the only way you're going to find it is if you find it like at a used bookstore or if you know somebody at ICLP that can buy you a copy. That's how I got this. A friend of mine that was at ICLP at the time bought me a copy. Um, it's also one you can skip. I mean, it's a good textbook. It's uh, So at this level, you're reading stuff for native speakers. Um, these are articles that were published in various, you know, journals and magazines and stuff, um, for native speakers. And then they're just annotated. Uh, so the idea here is that they're kind of holding your hand, leading you through like more, like progressively more difficult types of texts. Um, you've got first, the first lesson is the place of humanities and social sciences, uh, you've got the responsibilities of intellectuals. You've got a male-oriented society. Loss of intellectuals and the brain drain. Uh, exorcism and soul-searching. Uh, leisure gone awry. Doesn't anybody care anymore? That's kind of a weird title. Anyway, um, the, it, they're serious essays. Um they're aimed at an educated audience about, you know, serious topics. Uh, and they're, a lot of them are written by famous authors. Um, that each of them has, like, at the end of the lesson, it has, uh, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it'll tell you, like, wait for the camera to focus. I'm not sure if you can really see that, but it shows you the author, the book or publication that it came from, and the publisher, so you can track it down yourself if you want. Um, like I said, it's hard to find, but if you can find it, it's very good. If you can't, that's okay, because actually the next book um, is really similar. It's a little bit more difficult, but not much. So the interesting thing to me is ICLP, level 5 is Thought and Society, level 6 is this. Level seven is this, um, but really like I went from thought and society to this and I didn't really have any problem with it. So, uh, if you can't find this one, if you can find it, it's great. Uh, especially if you can find the audio, if you can't find it, it's not a big deal. This is easily available. It's, you know, you can buy it online. You can buy it in bookstores in Taiwan. Again, you see it's Vivian Ling. Um, this book is awesome. It's, uh, let me kind of show you. <clears throat> so there's how many sections? 12 sections. And each section is about a different, uh, I guess, category is, is from a different category of. So like you have culture, you have society, you have international, you have the economy, you have government, you have Taiwan, you have mainland China. Liang An, like the two, the two Chinas or the cross strait relations, uh, Gang Ao, so like um, Hong Kong and Macau. You've got Chinese diaspora, uh, education, and uh, science and the environment. So those are the twelve sections. Each section has four to six, I believe. No, four, four or five essays. And these, again, are real essays written by, like, public figures, intellectuals, 
and published in, mostly in, Chi in Taiwanese and Hong Kong publications, but some from the PRC too, I believe. And it's, like I mentioned earlier, you can see, like, you've got the main text, and then you have all the, like, vocabulary glosses below. And as you can see, most of them are in Chinese, some of them are in English. So if they think that you should be at a level where you can understand the um, explanation in Chinese, they give it to you in Chinese. If they think you probably need, um, you know, help with English, then they'll give it in English. But I believe by the end of the book, let me see. Oh, and another interesting thing about this, let me see if I can find an example. Ah, uh, here we go. Um, so this one, the great thing about this book is they really wean you off of English. So you can see some of those, and they even start to wean you off of explanations in Chinese. So they expect that by the time you're reading this lesson, those vocabulary words down there that don't have any definitions, they just have the word and the pinyin, they expect you to be able to understand what it means in context by that point. So they just list it in the vocab section to draw your attention to it. Uh, and of course, if you can't figure it out from context, you know, there's always dictionary or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's kind of more like a, you should be able to figure this out, but we're going to draw attention to it because you may not have seen this word before. Uh, so it's super useful. Um, there's, if I remember right, there's 52 lessons total in this book. And if you can read this entire book, you can read, like I said, anything that you would ever need to be able to read in modern Chinese, you'll be able to handle it outside of the specialized topics I talked about earlier, legal Chinese, stuff like that. You'll have to learn that yourself. But this, I mean, it's the most advanced uh, textbook that I know of for Chinese. One that's on a similar level, uh, but with a different, very different focus. So that's mostly like intellectual topics written by, you know, public intellectuals. This advanced Chinese reader uh, which I believe is available in both simplified and traditional uh, versions. And it's available overseas, it's available in Taiwan. It's really good, and it's got more variety of topics. So there's short stories, and there's essays, and, you know, um, it's a reader, you know, like I said. So at this level, like, it doesn't really matter if you don't have audio for this stuff because it is a reader. You're focused on reading. And by the time you're at this level, you should, your Chinese should be good enough that you don't really need audio anymore. You're just, you know, you're reading short stories and whatnot. Um, so it doesn't really matter that these don't have uh, audio. Uh, there's a couple other ones I want to mention. And then there's two books that I think are amazing supplements no matter um, let's see, I've got a bunch of new comments. Let me see. Uh, how would one get their hands on those Gu Jin Wen Xuan books you showed in another video? Uh, I believe they're available on books.com.tw. That's where I ordered them anyway. Um, and I don't think they're too expensive. I, I don't remember how much they cost. I, I bought them like eight years ago. Um, but yeah, they should be available there. Uh, and those are also good really good like supplemental readers at this level too um more detail on studying from a textbook i've primarily done anki and immersion now that i'm going to M mtc this fall i started using textbooks and chorusing shadowing I mean, that's that's what you want to do i mean um chorusing and shadowing focusing on the audio portion of the textbook uh, if you didn't see the earlier part of this uh, live stream go back and watch it later because i talk a little about that uh, and then also like adding the new vocabulary that you learn to your flashcard deck. Uh, and of course, getting practice using the stuff that you're learning, whether with your teacher or like go out with your friends and, and just try to sneak some of the stuff that you've learned into your conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously like using it a lot is, is going to help reinforce it, but, um, let's see. I get focus on audio primarily than vocab than read. You just do that until high comp comprehension and then... Yeah, I mean, it's... Like I said, get out and use it. Um, 
practice using it with your teacher, practice using it with your friends. Um, if you can find a good, a good, uh, language exchange partner, I had a fantastic language exchange partner when I was in Taiwan. Her name's Sarah. Uh, we still talk a lot. Um, we're still, you know, great friends. Um, she was doing a master's in interpretation and I was at MTC. So of course her English was way better than my Chinese. Um, cause she was an interpreter, but what I found with her, like I could, I could tell her what I was working on. I could show her the stuff that I had been learning and we would practice it or she would read the text and then we'd talk about it. Or sometimes like she assigned a, a movie for me to watch and then come back, you know, once I had watched it that we could talk about. So yeah, um, that for me, meeting with her once or twice a week was, it did wonders for my, for my Chinese. Um, so if you can find a, a good language exchange partner, that's not just going to sit there and chit chat with you the whole time, which is what a lot of language exchange ends up being. If you can find someone who wants to stay focused, um, it's invaluable. Uh, and she was actually, she was good in another way because she's an interpreter. And so her sensitivity to language was higher than it would be if she was just like, uh, a Taiwanese, a normal Taiwanese friend of mine, you know, uh, cause she was in a language related thing too. So if you're at the MTC, the translation interpretation school is on the, is in the same building. I forget which floor, but, uh, you could talk to, especially if you're at a higher level. Um, you could talk to some of the professors there and see if they could introduce you to, uh, um, some of the people in the department. Um, I actually audited or no, I took a, I took one semester of a interpretation course for credit while I was in grad school. And I took the second semester, like, I think I audited the second semester. And if you're at a high enough level, they really need native English speakers in that class to help, you know, with the local students, the Taiwanese students that are learning interpretation. Um, and it's a really good way to improve your Chinese if you're at an advanced enough level to, to be able to handle it. Um, let's see. I can tell you're not in the U S 2 PM here in Korea, U S are asleep. Yep. I'm in Tokyo. Um, the most impressive textbook collection I've ever seen. This doesn't even scratch the surface, man. Uh, I brought my favorite ones today. <clears throat> yeah, I went crazy when I was in Taiwan buying books and stuff. Um, and I, I was pretty hardcore about it. Ah, uh, uh, topic suggestion, learning to type non-pinyin. Yeah, so we could do that for sure. I use pinyin to type uh, and pretty much exclusively. Uh, Ash is really good with changjie. Um... So we could get him to, to talk about that. That would be a real, that's a good suggestion. Uh, speed reading skills in Chinese. That's another one that Ash would, uh, he spent a lot of time working on his reading speed to where he can't read quite as fast as a native speaker, I don't think, but he's getting pretty close to it, especially when it's stuff, you know, related to his research. So yeah, those are fantastic suggestions. Thanks. Um, okay. So last couple ones I want to mention, uh, News and views. If you can find the audio, this is another one of those. You can find the book at Lucky Bookstore, and I think you can find it online. You can't find the audio. So if you can find somebody that will hook you up with the audio, this textbook is amazing. Uh, it's it's news broadcasts, re recordings of news broadcasts. They don't give you the text. They just give um, the vocabulary that you're likely not to be familiar with, and they give you the... Um, you know, they give you a bunch of like exercises and stuff, sentence pattern drills and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but the actual like news broadcast that you listen to is nowhere to be found in here. So you, you can't even like buy the book and hire somebody to read it for you. You really have to have the, the original audio. If you can find it, it's good. I, I have it, but sorry guys, I can't, I, I'm pretty sure it's copyrighted, so uh, I can't share it, but it may be available online if you can find it. Uh, or if you have somebody that can that can hook you up from ICLP, um, this book, it's pretty high level. This is I think this is the same level at ICLP as this one. So it's level six. You're already quite advanced. 
Uh, I think they're real news broadcasts, if I remember right. Uh, this is the book. It's actually the book that I used to help me prepare for the uh, TOEFL, the test of Chinese of foreign language, when I took the highest level. Um, and I chalk up, I think, most of my ability to pass that test to, to this textbook and Thought and Society. So it's good. I just I, I can't recommend it as a main text because it's hard to find the audio. Um, this is not a textbook. This is a novel. Qi Wang um, is by Zhang Xiguo. And it's, um, it's the first, they teach this as a course at ICLP. So for a lot of people that go to ICLP, it's their first full novel that they read in Chinese. Um, uh, Zhang Xiguo is a well-known sci-fi author. Um, I don't believe this is sci-fi. To, to be honest, I didn't read the whole thing. I read like the first chapter or two, but then I just got so busy with other stuff that I never finished it. The good thing about this book specifically, if you want a first novel in Chinese, like, you know, by a native Chinese author, the good thing about this one is that ICLP has published a glossary for this novel. And so if you're at the level that you're ready to pick up a novel, you can go to IC, I mean, uh, you can go to the Lucky Bookstore at Shida, or you can go to, you know, probably a bunch of other bookstores that sell textbooks for for foreigners and get this glossary it's it's not one of the ones that iclp doesn't you know publish elsewhere it is it's again smc publishing the same people that publish uh, thought and society um and it's exactly what it sounds like it's just a glossary for all the vocabulary that you're likely not to be familiar with in uh in chi wang so <clears throat> this is you know, it's a fantastic supplement. Um, once you're at a, you know, reasonably advanced level where you can read a, a series, it's not a light, uh, excuse me. It's not a light, like Harry Potter type book. It's a, it's a serious book meant for adults. Um, and it's good. And it's, uh, you know, they, they talk, the dialogues are like, they talk like edu educated Taiwanese people. It's great. Um, Another one I want to recommend, these aren't textbooks, and they're not even meant for people learning Chinese. They're meant for people learning English. Um, it looks like there's maybe some more questions, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Okay, so I don't know, I'm not sure if these two books that I'm about to recommend are still published. If they're not, there's going to be something similar. Um, cause this style of book is super popular in Taiwan and in China. I've seen, I've seen versions, um, you know, from both. So this is a collection of 8,000 sentences in English and Chinese with accompanying audio. Um, and I think if I remember right, the audio is like a mini CD. So you, you need to have like, yeah, it's a, I still have the sleeve in the back. It's like a mini CD. Uh, you need to have something that can handle a mini CD. So you, you may have to go pick up like a USB CD drive, um, in order to make use of the audio. But if you can just rip that and put it on your phone, this, this book is like, it's like a secret weapon. I mean, cause it's just, they have so many different topics like traveling, partying, music, books, museums, hot springs, sports, games and gambling, movies, night markets, shopping, singing. That's from one unit. So that's relaxing and leisure time. There's another unit, clothing, fashions in different seasons, accessories, price of clothing, negotiating and paying, popular styles, getting a refund or exchange. And so each of these like sections has like two or three dozen sentences that are like things that you may say if you're in those situations. Like I said, it's meant for people learning English. So, but it's got, the audio has both. So you can, you can literally go through this book, 10,000 sentences in Chinese and English. And this is, this is a good one to pick up when you're an intermediate and just keep working on it as like a supplement to whatever else you're doing. Um, shadowing, like you could do it with shadowing. Um, 
could do chorusing, I guess, but it, it, it's a good book to do with shadowing. Just shadow a, a few dozen sentences per day. Um, review it, you know, occasionally as you go along. There was somebody in my interpretation class that had done, I, I, we had talked about this book like a year before that. And I told him about it and he went super hardcore about it. And I remember we were in the interpretation class and we were doing, uh, English to Chinese interpretation. And the sentence in English was like something about a hedgehog. And I don't even remember the word for hedgehog in Chinese, but he did like off the top of his head. He just knew it because he had learned it in this book. So, um, this type of book is great for building a wide base of vocabulary that you're probably not going to get in textbooks. I mean, as you saw, a lot of these textbooks are focused on like Chinese history, cross strait relations, stuff like that. So it's a particular, I guess, silo of vocabulary. Whereas this is like practical situations that you may run into, um, in English. So um, it's really good. There's another one that's, uh, it's similar, but it's fewer sentences. Let me see if I can get it to focus. This one. Like I said, I'm not sure if either of these is still published. Um, but something similar will be. So I, I definitely recommend picking up one or two of these types of books because you just get exposure to a ton of like everyday vocabulary that you're not likely to encounter otherwise. Um, Guys, my camera battery is about to die, so give me like 30 seconds to switch it out, and I'll be right back. Sorry. All right, I think that's working. Sorry about that. Um, okay, let's see. That's it for the book recommendations, but it looks like there's been a lot of chat in the in the chat box. So let me see if there's anything I need to address. If I'm looking to spend no more than two to four hours a day in class, what school would you recommend in Taiwan? I'll be a strong intermediate when I'll attend. MTC, I mean... Uh, that's exactly what MTC is. It's uh, two or three hours of classroom time, and then th and this is assuming that you need a, a visa. So there's certain requirements for for a visa. If you you said you're a doctor, if I remember right, so if you have a visa, otherwise, then you don't have these same like classroom hours requirements. But if you're on a student visa, I think you have to have at least. 15 hours in class a week or something like that. I forget exactly how it works, but uh, you can choose an option where you're in class for two hours a day or three hours a day. If you're two hours a day, then you need to take supplemental classes. So like there's these little cultural classes on the side, like one about, um, you know, learning the basics of Chinese calligraphy. There's one about tea culture. You know, it's like um, these little supplemental classes. But yeah, MTC is is the place, I, I think. It's got the, it's the biggest school in terms of enrollment. So it's got the best variety of different classes. If you go to one of the smaller schools, there's not going to be much available at intermediate and higher because there's just not enough students there to offer those classes. So I, I would definitely say MTC. Um, pretty high level B2 comprehension, 12 month scholarship term. Hopefully I can make it into an interpretation class. I'll try to find a good language partner too. Thanks for the advice. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, the interpretation class was, I took it while I was in grad school. I didn't take it while I was at MTC. Um, but I, I basically did it because I knew in grad school I was going to be focusing on a really narrow field or, yeah, a really narrow type of, of um, language, I guess. Um, I was going to be mostly reading about stuff in paleography and linguistics. So I wanted to take the interpretation class to keep my Chinese sharp, like in, in more general subjects and also to improve. 
Um, and man, it worked. It was, it was intensive. Um, but it, it did wonders for my Chinese and I still have all the materials we use. Like it was, uh, we would listen to like, uh, recent radio broadcasts, like interviews on the radio and stuff like that and, uh, take turns interpreting. So it's, uh, it's super useful. Um, Let's see, what's the use case for out-of-context isolated sentences? Uh, variety. It's just to supplement the core of what you're doing and also to get, like I said, a, a lot of vocabulary that you're not likely to run into elsewhere. Like, I mean, this one, for example, um, Linda deodorized the room with a spray. You're not going to learn that in a textbook, like how to say deodor to de deodorize a room. But it's, a, you know, it's something that from daily life that you're likely to encounter at least sometimes. Um, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't get so wound up. Don't fly off the handle. I seem to be in a fix. There's lots of food vocabulary, how to say Brussels sprouts. Um, so it's just, it's about getting a much broader... Uh, and more everyday uh, ability. I remember reading one time the the All Japanese All the Time blog, and he said something about like he knew a lot of people who were like at an advanced level in Japanese, but can you explain to somebody how to tie your shoes in Japanese? Like maybe you can attend a lecture, but can you tell someone how to tie your shoes in Japanese? And I thought like that's a really good litmus test for whether your language ability is too specialized to like textbooky type topics. Um, now, if you want to be specialized, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if uh, you want a more broad kind of general base in the language, once you get to the immediate intermediate level, I mean, this kind of stuff will really help with that and uh, giving you more everyday vocabulary that you're not likely to encounter otherwise. Um, been using the Shishang Zui Qiang book. Spent ages editing the audio and removing the English. Took such a long time, but I don't really like the sound of the pronunciation. Yeah, that that was a little annoying to me too, but I just ignored it because I wasn't I wasn't willing to take the time to edit the audio. But yeah, it is really good. Like I've recommended it online before, I think on Chinese forums, and I believe quite a few people picked it up based on that recommendation. And I never heard anyone say that they regretted doing it. I mean, it's it's a really useful book. Um, go to or have thoughts on LTL Chinese school. I was planning on using it so I can do all one-to-one -one intensive because work limits how long I can go to Taiwan. Uh, I've heard good things about it. I don't have any personal experience with LTL, but I have heard, I don't think I've ever heard any bad reviews. So if that's what you want to do is one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that at MTC also. Um, they're, they're quite set up for it. But yeah, I've heard great things about LTL. There's another one that I think is called Phoenix, maybe Phoenix Language School. I could be wrong about that. I'm trying to, it's been years since I've thought about this, but uh, there's a few like uh, TMI, the Taiwan Mandarin Institute. It's like a privately owned school. Um, there's a few like that in Taipei. Uh, LTL, I think is new. I don't think they were there when I was in Taiwan. Uh, but I've heard really great reviews of like all of those types of schools. So yeah. Um, what kind of visa will you need? Uh, a student visa is easy to get if you're enrolled at a, um, at an approved school like MTC. Uh, if you're at one of the private schools, it may be more difficult, but each school individually can tell you whether they can sponsor a visa or not. Um, it's been a while though. I mean, I, I moved to Tokyo seven years ago. So things may have changed in Taiwan. I don't know what they're like right now with the whole COVID thing. I, I don't believe they're letting people in right now. The COVID has gotten pretty bad in Taiwan recently. So uh, I don't know. I mean, you it's probably best to contact the school and, and they'll have somebody who's specialized in that and can help you. Um, so MTC, so actually MTC is at NTNU. Um, and yeah, they do, they do want you to be able to handwrite stuff. You do 
especially at the lower and kind of early intermediate stages, you tend to have daily handwriting tests where they will like call out the vocabulary word and you have to be able to write it. Uh, at the higher levels, they do that less. Like I took a newspaper reading course, which didn't use a textbook. We just used like recent newspaper articles. Um, we didn't do any handwriting, like they call it tingxie, like, which is like dictation. Uh, we didn't do any of that in that course. We didn't do it in, uh, the thought and society course, but we did in the earlier courses. So, um, I personally think handwriting is a useful skill. Uh, but I know a lot of people would prefer not to focus too much on it. Um, advice on transitioning from only recognizing simplified to recognizing traditional also. Um, yeah, it's a little easier to go the other way. Um, it's uh, because that's the way that simplification happened, right? They, you had traditional and then they simplified it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but there's, there's rules. And if you look up, there's a, I forget the, the title of the document, but you can easily find it like Wikipedia. If you read the Wikipedia article about simplified Chinese, they have a link to the document. Um, and there's basically three categories, if I remember right, of simplified characters. There's one category that's one-off simplifications. So this character in traditional is this character in simplified or these two characters in traditional get merged into this one character in simplified. So that's one category. The next category is like characters that get simplified whenever they show up as components in other characters. Um, and then the third category is those characters that those components show up in and that gets simplified systematically. Um, so there's only like a few hundred characters that you have to actually learn from the first category. There's a few hundred, uh, I forget exactly how many, like maybe 500 characters that you just have to memorize. All the rest of the simplifications were done in a systematic fashion. Um, so you can learn the, the, the components that get simplified systematically and you can basically make sense. Now I'm, t I'm talking in terms of going from simplified, uh, from traditional to simplified. You just do it the other way for simplified tr to traditional. Anytime you see such and such component, it gets, I guess, traditionalified, uh, in a certain way. So yeah, I would approach it that way. Like, I think there's some Anki decks that you can use, um, but yeah, there's only really a few hundred that you have to actually memorize. The other ones you can figure out uh, if you know the, the rules. Um, so, um, Tips on staying calm while learning. I tend to get nervous and put myself down because I get overwhelmed. Uh, that could actually be a whole video topic in itself, too. Um, when I first started learning Chinese, before I moved to Taiwan... I, I didn't get nervous studying. I got really nervous any time that I even thought about talking to somebody in Chinese. Um, to the point that like, I, I was somewhere, I forget where, and I, I wanted to, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to go up and I'm going to ask, what time do you close? Because I knew it was a Chinese speaker that was there. And so... I like really had to psych myself up to do it. And I did. And she like, you know, smiled really big and she said eight o'clock. Okay, great. And I ran off and it was like a huge victory for me. But then after that, I just, I never spoke and I, I was studying hard. Like I, I was using Chinese pot at the time. Uh, my listening, a bit, like when I got to Taiwan, I was at like a, a level where I could ask for directions and kind of basically understand what was said. Um, so I was like a, an upper beginner, I would say. Um, but I was super nervous. I had never had a real conversation. Um, I had actually, I hired a tutor and the first time we met, I was so nervous and the, like, I just froze up the entire, I mean, we must've sat there for an hour and said five sentences because I just, I couldn't get through a sentence. I was so, so nervous. I didn't want to make a mistake. I was embarrassed. 
Uh, and then the first time I actually had a real conversation, I had when I was moving to Taipei, uh, I flew from, I guess it was my hometown, Pensacola to L.A., L.A. to Shanghai, and I had like a 24-hour layover in Shanghai. So I stayed at a hostel there, and I had to talk to the cab driver to get me to the hostel. And so, and I was in the cab for 30 or 40 minutes, something like that. So I had to have a conversation. The guy kept talking to me. I understood basically what he was saying, and I was able to respond to his questions and ask questions of my own about stuff we were seeing. You know, I figured I'm in China for the first time in my life. I, I should just get over it and do it. And it just, for whatever reason, it just clicked and it worked. And by the end of that cab ride, I was like, huh, I speak a little Chinese. That's cool. But like, I had never had a conversation before that. Um, so I don't know about staying calm while learning. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but for me, the trick to get over my nerves as far as speaking Chinese was just exposure, just getting out and doing it. And uh, for me, like it was maybe a little easier because I had to accept that I was now I was in China for 24 hours and then I was living in Taiwan. And so I had to I had to get out and speak Chinese. Um, and so that made it a little easier to get over the nerves because it was just like I had to do it. Um yeah, I don't I don't know if that answers your question. Um hopefully. Uh, if if not, let me know and and maybe we can do another video about it. Um Pensacola is a great town. I did my family medicine rotation there in 2013. Love the shallow ocean water. Yeah, the beach is gorgeous, man. Uh that's um my dad lives close to the beach, so whenever I'm in town, I I stay there a lot. Yeah, it's they've got a training hospital there. My mom is a, a nurse in the operating room there. So, uh, yeah, Pensacola is a pleasant place. Great, great food, you know, coastal southern food. It's awesome. Um, all right, I think I've caught up. There was a lot of chat this time, which is really cool. Uh, I think I've caught up with all the questions. Um, we've got some great topics for, for future lessons or for future, you know, live streams. Um, so I'll, I'll add those to the list. And like I mentioned last time, we were thinking about doing some sort of trans, uh, subscription model for, for these. Um, if we do that, like, like I said last week, I'm not committing to that yet. If we do it, it'll be a while before we do it. I want to keep doing these and like get a better feel for it. You know, do several that are more smooth than the last few have been. Uh, I guess I need to get a, uh, like an AC adapter. So I don't have to rely on battery for this camera. Uh, it'll be a while before we do anything like that. So we'll, we'll have quite a few more topics. I want to do maybe next week we'll do, uh, one that's like more about outliers research. Maybe I can get Ash to talk about old Chinese and middle Chinese. Uh, or maybe I can talk about, um, how to learn seal script or something like that, but kind of something more related to what outlier is, I guess, more known for, excuse me, guys. Um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep doing these one per week. Um, for now, like I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying them. Um, like I said last week, they take a lot of preparation, but they seem to, uh, I think they seem to have some value. So, uh, I'd like to keep doing them. Um, yeah, get in touch with any uh, recommendations for topics or anything that you'd like to hear us talk about. Uh, anything related to learning Chinese, basically, uh, or other, you know, doesn't have to be Mandarin. It can be, uh, um, you know, Cantonese. Like I said, Ash speaks Cantonese quite well, so we could do that. Um, and yeah, uh, quite, quite a lot of talk this time about school recommendations. So, like I said, ICLP is like the gold standard. It's expensive though, and it's really intensive. Um, if you're at ICLP, you basically don't have time for anything else. Uh, but you can replicate the, at least the curriculum, if not the teaching approach, anywhere else. And I really would like a lot of people. When I was at MTC, a lot of people were unhappy with it and went elsewhere. Uh, I personally had a great experience there, and so I would recommend it. Um, 
like I said earlier, for the sheer variety of courses they have, because they have something like 2,000 students per year, whereas other programs maybe have like 100 or 200, something like that. So they're just able to offer a much bigger, more interesting variety of courses, especially as you get to the more advanced levels. Um, there were other schools that just didn't have any advanced classes because they, their students didn't stick around long enough. So for intermediate and advanced, especially, I would say MTC is the place. Um, well, thank you, Constantine, for showing up. Thank thank you everyone for showing up. This has been a lot of fun. It, <laughs> we went two hours this time. I was going to try to keep it to one, but uh, maybe I should start breaking these into two parts so they're not so long, but hopefully it was useful. Um, like I said, get in touch with us if you have suggestions for future topics. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the pronunciation course, like I said, I, I, I don't want to make these about promoting our products, but, um, it will really help you to squeeze as much juice as possible out of the textbooks that you're using. Um, the first two units of the pronunciation course are about you know, the basics of pronunciation. The last unit really is about, it, it will help you with your pronunciation, of course, because it's about improving your accent and whatnot, but uh, it really teaches a new way of approaching language learning that I think is much more effective. So uh, if you haven't taken it and, you know, you want to, like I said, it's 20% off right now, Memorial Day sale that we're going to extend probably another 24 hours or so. So, um, Let's see. Oh, there's a little more. Uh, Tokyo has changed a lot, even from five to seven years ago. Tons of English there now. Yeah, it really has. I moved here seven years ago. Um, it has changed a lot. Lots more English, for sure. Uh, easier to get around. There's more, like, even, like, craft beer. This is a weird thing, but it's, like, a, a kind of interest of mine. When I first moved here, there were a few craft beer bars. And there were a few breweries. Now it's everywhere. Um, so it's really easy if you're into craft beer. Now Tokyo is a great place for craft beer. And a lot of the Japanese brewers are doing really interesting stuff. So it's a it's a pleasant place to live. I really like it. Decided to go to MTC after reading your write-up on Chinese forums. ICLP would be nice if I had the money. Thanks for inf info and inspiration. Trying to replicate your experience there. Yeah, so if you're interested in this stuff, like I did write a few years ago, or I guess eight years ago or nine years ago now, I wrote a big post on Chinese forums about my experience studying at, at the MTC. MTC has changed a bit since I was there, but the thread is still going. I mean, people have updated it with new changes since then. So uh, if you're thinking about going there, I recommend Googling for that Chinese forums, Mandarin Training Center. Uh, you'll find my post on that. And uh, I also, I used to write a blog. I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading my old blog. Like, there's maybe some useful stuff, but it's mostly just me rambling for myself. I never really thought anybody would read it. Um, so I'm trying to do some of these live stream topics on things that I wrote about on my blog so that I can, like, you know, make it a little easier to find this stuff and not have to dig through all my, like, random thoughts about what I was doing at the time. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm glad that thread was useful for you. Um, oh, Hubert, merci for coming, uh, you know, for showing up. So, okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and end it. We're right at two hours. Uh, and I think I've answered everyone. So, uh, if I didn't let me know, just, you know, post a comment. Um, in, you know, underneath the video on YouTube, not in the, not in the live chat, because that's about to end. Um, but yeah, po post a comment underneath if I missed something that you're uh, wanting me to answer, or if there's a, you know, a topic that we can do. Uh, and I'll, I'll figure out the next topic and I'll, I'll send out an email probably Monday, like I usually do. So, all right, guys, thanks very much. Uh, take care.